pleasure to introduce to you um, Senator Kutcher. Uh, he is a Nova Scotian, but he serves us in our federal offices as a senator in Ottawa. Um, what's unique about Senator Kutcher and the lens that he brings to our Senate is his extensive background in mental health advocacy and research. So as we kind of cover in our Canadian history courses, senators are not just politicians, but they're engaged in our community in a variety of ways. And Senator Kutcher has been a professor and a dean at many of the universities that you will be applying to as you kind of get to grade 12 and get excited about post-secondary studies. So uh, what's great about Senator Kutcher is he can kind of serve two conversations here, both the mental health piece especially the focus on adolescence, as well as um, talking about his role in our federal government. Um, so I'll pass the stage over to you. Senator Kutcher, thank you so much. I was asked to talk to you a little bit about what a senator is, what a senator does, and how I chose, because it's different, chose to become a senator. And then we would open up for questions about any of the issues that you want to talk about. I got it correct. So why don't I start with how Canada actually became Canada. <clears throat> so back in the 1860s, there were no provinces, there were no territories, there was settlement, there were indigenous peoples, there was an ongoing conflict between French and English forces. The United States was a young country. It was a very, very, very different time. And the idea was to create something called a federation. A federation is really different than the same country. Federation means a coming together of autonomous entities who agree to work together under a set of common rules and principles. That's what the Federation is. In Canada is a country, but it is a federation. And that makes us sort of unique because when this country was born, it was the first time ever in all of history that a country developed both as a federation and a parliamentary democracy. First time. It was a total experiment. And when Canada started, there was Upper Canada. Which is now called it today. Lower Canada, which is called now Quebec. New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, which has just changed its name to something else. And Nova Scotia, and that was the Atlantic region. And so they weren't provinces, they weren't territories, they were just governance entities from the British government which came together and said we want to work together. First there was an economic union, then there was a political union. And when this country was set up, it was set up to be sort of a little bit, quite a bit, somewhat modeled on the United Kingdom, what was called the Westminster model of government with a House of Commons elected by the people, a 
House of Lords which was appointed and often was hereditary and a constitutional monarchy, the Queen of the King at the top of the pyramid. And when Canada was set up, there was exhausting discussion amongst the leadership of Upper Canada, Lower Canada, and the Atlantic provinces about how the country would be set up. And there was a lot of conflict and a lot of debate. People wouldn't agree. They had, they had trouble agreeing on how this country would be set up. But they eventually decided that there would be a House of Commons and that the House of Commons would have membership that was elected by the people. So it was the body in Parliament that was the voice of the people. Now at that time there was a big concern, particularly from the Atlantic provinces, that population was growing really high on Upper Canada and in Lower Canada, but the Atlantic provinces population was not as high, and the Atlantic provinces didn't want to get swamped by Upper and Lower Canada. So they created a balance balance to elect the House, and that balance that they created was the Senate. And there was more time spent in discussing how the Senate would work than any other single topic in the debates about the Federation. We wouldn't have Canada if we didn't have the Senate. <coughs> country was set up so that we would have a balance between an elected house and an appointed group of people. And that those two bodies would be complementary to each other. So neither would be in charge of the other, but they would complement each other. Now, the House of Commons reflects the will of the majority of people, supposedly. No, that it doesn't really, because the ruling party didn't have the most people vote for them. And the House of Commons is divided on party lines. Our democracy runs on the basis of political parties. In the Senate, it's different. At one time, the Senate was appointed by the Prime Minister to reflect partisanship. You entered the Senate because you had been a stalwart in a political party. So if you had been a conservative, you had a good chance of being appointed as a conservative senator. If you were a liberal, a liberal senator of the parties, didn't have enough power that you could get appointed as an NDP or a Green or or anybody else. But, and this is an important but, when the Senate was set up, it was not set up to reflect parties. In 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on the role of the Senate in Canada's parliamentary system. And the Supreme Court noted that the Senate had to be independent of the House, and that it should not serve a partisan political purpose, meaning that the senators shouldn't be members of political parties or reflecting what political parties wanted, and that incoming prime minister, who's the current prime minister, made the changes in the Senate to reflect that Supreme Court rule. So that the Senate is no longer populated by people who see themselves as liberals or conservatives primarily. And they're not there to vote the way the leader of the conservatives or that the leader of the liberal or the NDP or whoever tells them how to vote. 
So the, since 2015, all the people that have been appointed to the Senate are independent of political parties. I don't belong to a political party. I don't represent a political party. I don't answer to a political party. I don't vote the way a political party wants me to vote. So that's a really big change. And the second is in the process of this evolution. There still is a small group of senators who are a remnant of the previous model. They're, they identify themselves as members of the conservative party, and they vote as a group. But the vast majority of senators don't identify with any political party and don't vote as a group. We vote ourselves, how we think on every single piece of legislation. Our primary goal, our primary goal is to make the legislation that the House brings to us better. That's what we do. And you see that reflected in the number of times the Senate amends or changes a piece of legislation that comes to us. It is now much more common for the Senate to change legislation than not to change it. Now that legislation goes back to the House of Commons, where the House of Commons gets the final say. But much of the time, many, if not most of the changes that are made in the Senate are accepted by the House of Commons. So our primary role is to make the legislation for Canada better. The other thing about being in the Senate is that we are bound to represent our regions. So I'm a senator independent from Nova Scotia. I represent the people who live in Nova Scotia, whether or not they vote. So if you're 12 and you don't vote, and you live in Nova Scotia, I still represent you. And if you want to talk to me, you can. And if you have ideas, I want to listen to them. I do not represent the government of Nova Scotia. Very different. Completely different. And there have been times since I've been in the Senate that I have disagreed with what the government of Nova Scotia has been doing, and there will be times in the future that I will continue to disagree or agree, but I don't represent the government. I represent the people of the province, whether they vote or don't vote. The other thing is that one of my constitutional foci is that I need to speak for people who are drowned out in the voices of the majorities. So if you don't happen not to be part of the majority group in a constitutional democracy, your voice is going to be drowned out by the larger groups. So what recourse do you have? Well, constitutionally, the Senate is supposed to speak for the vulnerable and the minorities. So we are to make sure that the voices of people who aren't part of the majority are heard and that those voices can be used to amend or improve legislation. Those voices can be used to draw the attention of Canada's government to the needs and opinions that those people have, which may be different than the majority. So it's a balance. It's a bit more of a balance. And because of that, we can take unpopular stands. Stands that the majority may not agree with, but might be what needs to be done. <coughs> 
And the reason we could take those unpopular stands is because senators are not elected. We don't have to come back and say, please give me your votes. I want what the majority wants. We can say, we hear the majority, and that's really important, but there are other people who have different perspectives. There are other people who have different needs. There are other people who think differently. Let's listen to them as well. So because we're not bound by the electoral cycle, we can make sure that those voices get heard in the discussion in the parliament. The other thing with that is we have a fixed age and we can no longer be a senator. That's age 75. So some people can be in the Senate for 15 or 20 or 30 years. The average time someone can be in Parliament is quite sh a lot shorter than that. So we bring what's called institutional memory to government. So institutions like the school have to have what's called an institutional memory. What are the values of the school? How does the school discharge its responsibility to you in previous decades and will continue to discharge that responsibility to you? How does the school integrate its community and what role does it have and how will that continue to integrate? Those are components of what's called institutional memory. They go beyond who you and I are in our moments in time. They have a historical precedent. They have a historical presence, and they remain into the future. I can't, if I'm in here for three or four years, carry that institutional memory. That's why it's so important to have that built into it. If you have a hockey team, you want to have rookies and you want to have veterans. It's the veterans that carry that memory. And same way in Parliament. So the Senate carries that long-term perspective. And parliamentarians, a shorter-term perspective. And that's, again, one of those things that balances stuff. Now, democracies are really messy forms of government. They're really messy. It's hard to get people to agree to do things. Different people have different opinions and very strongly held opinions. And sometimes some of those opinions even have some facts behind them. Sometimes they don't. So a democracy needs both the ability to move quickly and to respond, but it also needs the component of a foundation of stability is this concept of balance. So that's how our country works. For better or for worse. We're a federation. We're a parliamentary democracy that has a House of Commons, which reflects the will of the people, and the Senate, which represents regions and people who are in minority groups. And we work together to complement each other. Neither is higher than the other. And we complement each other. The way that senators now come to be senators is so different than before. And I will share with you sort of my story of how I ended up in the Senate. Now, I'm a doctor. How does a doctor get into the Senate? There are actually four physicians, four doctors in the Senate. Senator Rivalia from Newfoundland, who's a family doctor. Senator Meiji from Quebec, who's a family doctor. Senator Moody from Toronto, who's a pediatrician in need. And we've become quite a team. And we bring a lot of expertise to that table. And we bring expertise on the medical side, but the amazing people who are in the center bring unbelievable expertise in all sorts of areas. The person that sat a little down to my left 
before he left, the Senator was Senator Murray Sinclair, who was the head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. The judge, outstanding legal mind, amazing driver of reconciliation with Indigenous people. I learned so much from him. My seatmate, Senator Peter Boone, who was the assistant deputy minister for foreign affairs for Canada, one of the people that directed our foreign policy. He had been a previous ambassador to Germany. A Nova Scotia senator, Senator Wanda Bernard, a national leader in combating racism. Outstanding human being, outstanding Nova Scotia, outstanding Canadian. Mary Coyle, another Nova Scotian senator, was the head of the Cody Institute at St. Francis Xavier University. Long standing career in international and global. Humanitarian. <clears throat> senator Colin Deacon. Innovation and business development. Howard Weston, who was from Cape Breton, but is from Ontario, one of the finest legal minds of the country. Senator Mark Gold from Quebec, who was the government leader in the center, a top notch constitutional scholar. <coughs> These are the people that are there. I'm actually humbled to be in their company. So, Senators are not professional politicians. We bring a wealth of other experience to the upper chamber, and we use that wealth of experience individually and collectively to analyze all the legislation and do our other work. So where did I come from? Well, my parents, were both refugees during World War II from a country called Ukraine. My mother came with her parents and her brother. They had lost everything. They were farmers. My grandfather was a tailor. They survived the camps. They made it through. They weren't annihilated. They didn't starve to death. They were really lucky. They made it to Canada. My grandfather <clears throat> opened up his first bank account in this country with And they made a life for themselves. He and my grandmother worked as tailors in Toronto on Spadina Avenue, what was called the Schmata industry. When they died, they owned apartment buildings and property and all sorts of stuff around Toronto. You see, they saved every penny. My mom work at home, because that was almost no way that it happened in those days. Then she went and got herself a job and ended up working for Air Canada in charge of the uniforms. Her brother became senior vice president on the Canada banks, and one of his children my cousin, Mark, played for the Toronto Maple Leafs for 15 years. My dad left his family when he was 16 to go to school and never saw anybody again. They either died in the war or were killed by Stalin. The whole family gone, except for another brother that managed to flee. 
My dad made it through the war as a teenager, your age, by himself. He survived the bombings of Dresden. Look at the bombings of Dresden to get an idea of what that was like. He somehow made it through to the Allied sector in Berlin. Who knows how? He never told. And he came to Canada because the day that he was slated to leave, there were two countries in which you were accepting people. One was Argentina, and one was Canada, and the line to Canada was shorter. Here we are. I have two brothers. One's a periodontist, the other's a gastroenterologist. My first love was history. I went and did a, doing a PhD in history when I decided that I wanted to go to medical school instead. I'll talk about a 180 degree turn <laughs> from historian to a physician. I had never taken a biology course past grade 10. My undergraduates were all in political theory, geography, philosophy, and history. There was only one medical school in the country that would take someone like me called McMaster. It was an experimental school, and they took me. And I learned all the sciences, and I learned neuroscience. And I went into my field of psychiatry completely by chance. I was really interested in internal medicine and in surgery. I can still remember the first time in a chest operation where I held a beating human heart in my hand. Oh gosh, I want to do a cardiac sickness. So that was a real interest. Then the other interest was internal medicine, endocrinology, the immune system. At that time, we're just starting to learn about the immune system. You hear a lot about it now. We're just starting to learn about it. That was exciting. Really exciting. And then I met two people that changed the trajectory of my life in medicine forever. One was Dr. Nahum Spinner, who was really a Talmudic scholar dressed up as a psychiatrist. And the other guy was Joel Elkis, who was the father of neuropharmacology, who was doing groundbreaking work on the brain and behavior. And I realized <clears throat> that the discipline of psychiatry brought together the works of William Shakespeare, the cellular biology at the molecular level, and could potentially explain why we feel the way we feel why we think the way we think and why we behave the way we behave. So I went into that field because it was like, seemed like a lot of fun. And from there, the road got tortuous. I started to work with young people, kids your age, because <clears throat> I realized that mental illnesses began young. I set up the first unit in Canada for young people who were sick and did all the research on why do people get sick and how could we treat them and how could we make it what their lives better. And I did that in Toronto. And then I came to Halifax. By that time I was married and had three young kids. And I was being recruited to Stanford in, in California and Columbia and New York, head up their departments. And my wife said, if you want to go to either Stanford or Columbia, you're going alone? Because I don't want our kids to go up and be Americans. So we came to Halifax. And it was great. It was an incredible place to live. A wonderful place to be. We now have seven grandkids. Four of them live in Prince 
of the Bible, which is a good number of them now. Amazing. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful part of the book. Along the way, I worked with the World Health Organization. Spent 30 or so years in sub saharan Africa, China, South America, the Caribbean, Latin America, the Middle East. Learned a ton of stuff. Learned how people all over the world were more alike than they were different. Learned the importance of listening and respecting. Learned the value of people who thought differently, who looked different from me, and who brought perspectives to life that I <coughs> never thought of before, never understood previously. Learned how important it was to learn from everyone and not to think that I knew the answers. Learned to realize that it was in diversity and inclusion that we were able to actually make the greatest successes that needed to be made. And that without science and best available evidence, we were just shooting in the dark. And I was an associate dean of international health. I built the international health programs, helped build the international health programs at the University. And when I was thinking about how else I might be able to contribute and what else I could do with the incredibly rich life that I had the privilege to live, I thought, hmm, maybe I could go to Parliament. And in 2011, I ran as a candidate in the federal election when Michael Ignatyuk was the leader of the Liberal Party. And the reason I ran was because at that time, Mr. Ignatyuk was committed to setting up a national child plan so that kids could have the best start in life. Everywhere in the country. And I thought I wanted to be part of that. Well, the election of 2011 is history. Mr. Magic didn't do well. I ran for the Liberal. I lost. And I said, I've had it. I'm out of here. This is too many problems. And it wasn't until many years later that a number of my friends who were in the Senate said, listen, Senate's a very different place. The Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, he changed the Senate. He said, no more liberal partisans. From now on, senators are going to be independent. You're going to be appointed not by the fact that you've been a liberal for your life or a conservative for your life, but because you're going to apply to an independent commission. And that independent commission is going to look at all the applications and they're going to make suggestions. And you're going to be independent. You can look at legislation. You can do what you need to do without having to be part of a political party apparatus. And I was like, whoa, that is really neat. Historically, I don't know what it is. Historically, that's just amazing. A huge institutional change for Canada. Maybe I want to be part of that. So I applied. And a while later, I was teaching in Belize, that's you know, Caribbean area, region. I was teaching in Belize because one of the programs I developed was coming into the country of Belize, and I was teaching people how to do the work that needed to be done. And I got a phone call. It was the Prime Minister, and he was supposed to be in the Senate. I said, How fast my wife? <laughs> So that's how I got there. And it's an incredible place to be. You see the best of humanity and you see problems of humanity. You see people with different perspectives trying to do the work that needs to be done to make this country a better place for everybody. You see all sorts of division. 
and yet you also see unity. And it's an incredible privilege to be there and to be able to nudge how Canada moves forward. And it's a nudge, a little nudge. So that's me, that's the Senate. And here I am with you for the next little while and so I'm going to make myself available for any question that you have.